Um, hello, everybody. <clears throat> My name is Jonathan Peraza Campos, and I am the program specialist for Teaching Central America at Teaching for Change. It is an honor to be here with you. Today, I want to emphasize and celebrate the fact that indigenous peoples live all across the American continents and around the world. Like much of Latin America, Central America is characterized by its ethno-racial, cultural, linguistic, and geographic diversity. In fact, Central America today, specifically Guatemala, is home to one of the largest indigenous groups in the Latin American region, along with Peru and Bolivia. So what we're gonna do today is we are going to talk a little bit about what Teaching Central America is and really elevate Teach Central America Week, which is happening um, this coming week. We're going to understand some of the indigenous groups of Central and Latin America. We're gonna look at the Maya peoples and the Popol Vuh, they're gonna, the Garinagu people. Um, we're gonna learn a little bit about modern indigenous resistance, and then we are going to close out. So I'm really excited to be here with you. So at Teaching Central America, educators and community can find resources that celebrate the history and culture of Central America. This campaign encourages and supports teaching about the region through a growing collection of lessons, book lists, biographies of noted historical people, and free readings. Um, and we really do hope that you will join us as a participant in Teach Central America Week uh, that is launching October 3rd to the 9th. Um, this is our fourth annual Teach Central America Week, and uh, please do go to our website and sign up and engage your students or your community in a kind of lesson using one of our resources or one of your own and send us, send us a teaching story after you've um, engaged in Teach Central America Week, and we will send you a book in gratitude from our collection at Teaching for Change. So really looking forward to y'all's participation in that. And so let me see the chat box. Let me see where y'all are coming from. We got some folks at University of North Carolina, Durham, North Carolina. We got some folks from Texas, from LA, um, where I was born actually. Um, but I'm based in Atlanta, actually. I'm based in Atlanta here um, in Georgia. So we got some Massachusetts in the house. Beautiful. Thank you, everybody, for being here. Um, so we're going to do a warm up to familiarize ourselves with the expansive groups of Central America, of the indigenous peoples of Central America, I mean. So we are going to do an activity where we will use this tool called Native Land Digital um, to acquire an understanding on who of whose ancestral lands the Central American nation states of today were built upon. Just some context, Native Land Digital is this tool that aims to really visualize uh, the ancestral indigenous territories, as well as uh, providing information on treaties and languages um, that relies on relations with indigenous peoples from these places and their leaders, um, and it engages folks who make maps, who do work in GIS, as well as this intercultural affairs um, through this Canadian nonprofit, Native Land Digital, uh, which is also the name of the tool. So what we're gonna be doing today is we are going to use this, we're gonna put a link in the chat box for Native Land Digital. Um, and when you get to Native Land Digital, let me show you what it looks like. You're going to use this uh, search bar right here, and you're gonna put in one of the names of the indigenous groups of the, one of the countries of Central, American, um, of Central America, among them Belize, Guatemala, El Salvador, Honduras, Nicaragua, Costa Rica and Panama. You're going to put one of these countries in the search bar and you are going to see, you know, what indigenous groups come up for the countries that you search. Um, and then you're going to put the names of the indigenous peoples that you find within these colonial borders, these nation states, in the chat box for us all to really see how diverse in terms of indigenous communities Central America is. Because we're going to be focusing on the peoples of Guatemala, Honduras, um, and uh, yeah, Guatemala and Honduras today, I do want to give some more love to the other countries that we will not be focusing on. So, you know, look at Belize, look at Nicaragua, Costa Rica, Panama, El Salvador, especially, and list out the names of the folks that you see there. Um, and also make note that of, of any groups that transcend kind of current borders, if it helps you, um, there is this function right here, settler labels, that adds kind of the, the borders of modern day nation states. Uh, on the map if that helps you for your reference. But yeah, go ahead and engage with that tool and um, put the names of these groups in the chat box for me. So we see some entries right now. We see the Nahua, Lenca, and Matagalpa people. 
We see the Wetar people of Costa Rica. And mind you, I might not be pronouncing some of these correctly uh, because these are the names in the particular languages of these folks as well. So just wanna put that out there. Um, it's good to get the actual um, pronunciation of these communities right when we are teaching about it. In Terra, Peters. In Guatemala, we see the Ishil, the Kekchi, the Chorti, the Nahua, the Pocomchi. I actually taught in 2019 in Guatemala. Um, and the village that I worked in, uh, most of my students were Kekchi in the north, in the kind of central northern part of Guate. So, you know, it was really amazing to learn from my students. All right, we got some great um, responses in the chat box. And so, and if you haven't been able to add your, um, just your kind of research notes in the chat box, please go ahead. But um, just to keep moving us forward, I want to hear from y'all. Feel free to use the microphone as well as the chat box. Um, what groups did you find? We already kind of started a little bit of that conversation, but what was that experience like for you? What was new or interesting to you? And for groups whose ancestral lands transgress borders, what implications do you think that has on those people and the nation states? Let me hear from y'all. You can get off microphone if you're brave and the chat box is all yours. Anyone, anyone? Um, can you hear me? Sorry. Yes. So I noticed um, the Lenka population, and I know that the Lenkas um, stretch um, from in Honduras, but also in El Salvador. And as far as implications that you were mentioning, I wonder, um, because I know, right, with like Berta Casares and, and uh, you know, more prominent indigenous um, folks from Honduras, but not as much as the Lenca population in El Salvador. So I'm very curious about that. Like that stands out to me that um, it's, that I don't know enough about the El Salvador Lenca folks. Mm. It's a very interesting response. Thank you, right? So the Lenca are very, um, Berta Cáceres, who we're actually gonna talk about later. You know, she's Lenca and there's, Definitely a, a strong sense of Lenka, not a strong sense, right? Um, but there is a presence of Lenka peoples and the communities and their struggles in Honduras, but not so much in El Salvador where there is a Lenka presence as well, um, but it's not really um, as well understood. We see also in the chat box, perhaps there are families who ended up being divided as borders became more formal and travel was restricted. The linguistic and cultural depth and the breadth of the pre-invasion area now known as Central America is off the charts. The Spanish and the Portuguese, just the European invaders, did a number on these um, territories and these peoples, right? And Noel says, how hard it must be for the indigenous groups to have their land defined by a government not their own. That is just some colonial violence that has defined many of these communities or has really shaped many of these communities for centuries, right? So that's a very important um, conversation to have about, you know, the, the impact of these social and political fictions that we call borders on sovereignty and, and hum, human rights. <clears throat> so, you know, thank you everybody for your great contributions and the conversation. Um, I want us to kind of reflect on some other questions as we move into kind of more of our content. Um, and I wanna do elevate Samantha's question that you just put in the chat box. I wonder also how many of these tribes or peoples have lost their cultures or still exist today. You know, there's this is some research that we have to do to, and you know, we also have to remember that indigenous peoples have never been just victims. Indigenous peoples have worked endlessly for their sovereignty to protect the land, uh, to revitalize their cultures and languages, and and have them persist in the face of. Um, assimilation, genocide, and these other forms of colonial violence. So um, great questions to ask and do research around to really give a full narrative of the resistance of indigenous peoples. So my question for you is, 
and you can use a chat box as well as a microphone. Where do you find and see corn in our modern world? And what does corn mean to you? So take some time, the chat box, uh, use the microphone if you like. Michelle says corn is comfort. You see it in your garden, Michelle. That's amazing. Brian says it's everywhere. There's sugar. Okay. Cornbread and beans. Uh, Rebecca's from Kentucky. So that's, you know, that's our bread and butter in Kentucky. Grew up on a farm in Piedmont, North Carolina. Guatemala is your second home because of how corn is so pervasive. Popcorn, <laughs> right? Um, sweet corn came from the Amish. Entertainment in the fall and decorations. Bread, soup, oil, ethanol, feed for cattle, chips, corn on the cob, corn tortillas, uh, feed for chickens. Uh, beyond the native stories, I was told as a child, it feeds the livestock we eat. So as we can see on oh, elotes, Tara's talking about elotes um, from street vendors in LA. Corn signifies the end of summer harvest. So corn has many meanings. It has, you know, it's a reference point in different ways for many of us, right? Corn is really important in the modern day. Uh, you know, I get my students to think about, my Latino students especially, to reflect on, you know, how corn is a big part of our diets. And then we start asking, why is that? Where does that come from? So next question I want to engage you with is in your religion or belief system, or maybe one that you've witnessed that you have proximity to, how did humans come to be? What is the creation story of your people or the people whose creation story you've um, been a student of or heard of, learned about? Where did humans come from? What's our creation story? We see some folks saying we are made of stardust from star ancestors. Michelle says an evolution of the Big Bang. Okay. The Catholic narrative of Adam and Eve, a divine creator shaped from earth. Mm -hmm. you know, we all have a creation story. We all have a story of where humans came to be, where we originated from. Those that are raised Southern Baptist um, get the traditional story. Um, and some of us, you know, might stray far from the, the, the religions, the belief systems that maybe we were taught growing up. Jenna says sky woman. Okay. From Native Americans, we evolved from animal people. Okay. Many different creation stories that have been passed on for centuries, right? Separations of water, land, light, dark, animals, plants. Cool. Thank you for your responses, everybody. So the reason I'm asking you these questions is because I want to introduce, or maybe I'm not introducing this to you, uh, but I want to elevate um, the Popol Vuh. So the Maya Quiche of Guatemala, over what is now known as Guatemala, um, and you know the Maya Quiche were across Mesoamerica and into Mexico as well, um, and they were a large uh, kingdom. They were at their peak at a certain point in time, and one of the pieces, one of the pieces of their culture that is with us today is the Popol Vuh, and. It's really, it's a shame for me when I hear that folks have not heard of the Popol Vuh because the Popol Vuh to the Maya, uh, the Maya Quiche specifically, is just as important as the Christian Bible and the Quran and the Torah and the Ramayana. It is a sacred ancestral text, a religious text that explains the worldview of the Maya, um, the Quiche Maya. And so the Popol Vuh is a beautiful narrative that really gives us some insight into the world of the Maya at the time. Um, and so we're going to watch this video uh, provided by the Living Maya Time website, um, <clears throat> produced by the National Museum of the American Indian. And as we're watching this video, I want you to reflect on these two questions. What is important to the Maya people? What do they believe? And think about our questions that we just discussed and how it ties in here as well. So we're going to watch this video about the Popol Vuh. I love to introduce this narrative to my students. Um, I work with mostly Latino students. And you know, we talk a lot about our diet as, la as Latinos, as Latin Americans, because so much of what we eat is corn-based, like tortillas being one of them. And you know, my family's from El Salvador and Guatemala, like we're very corn-based people. Uh, we're children of the corn, literally children of the corn. And you know, the story talks about how corn is ancestral, it's sacred in our cultures. And 
so much of our foods today as Latinos are very much corn based. And it's just, you know, it's a beautiful way to just reframe our relationship to our food. Um, and so we see folks that, you know, love um, this story, love the, the, the native creation stories. Um, can you put the link? Yes, we will put the link. It was powerful. It's beautiful, right? The Popol Vuh. It's, it's, it's a shame that we don't know about it when it has persisted for centuries as um, a story about how powerful corn is and its sacred qualities. And this is a, a narrative that you'll hear across indigenous cultures in the Americas, the importance of corn and other food ways. And so uh, one activity I really like to do with my students as well is, you know, we watch the video to see, you know, the, the pictographic kind of rendition of the Popol Vuh. And then I give them the transcript that Keisha has put in the, um, in the chat box and I, I, get, I get them to read it uh, independently and find their favorite scene and then have them create their own pictographic representation of their, of their um, favorite scene from the story. And that engages them in their literacy skills or comprehension skills, right? And this is for middle and high schoolers, um, not just for elementary schoolers. You know, art is a powerful form of literacy and it's visual literacy, right? So definitely engage your students in, in similar forms of literacy if you like. And with and you know, th this uh video comes from the website um Living Maya Time from the National Museum of the American Indian. You can find it right here. Um the creation story of the Maya, some more explanation, um, and the video. And then, uh, and you know, there's a bunch of other kinds of components of this website that to learn about the scientific methods and the measurement systems developed by the Maya. Most people don't know that the Maya invented the mathematical concept of zero. That is a huge contribution to the world, I would say. And then, you know, for teachers, there's some other lesson plans to really engage their students in these different uh, ways of knowing of the Maya people. So definitely look through the website. The link is in the chat box. <clears throat> and if you work with younger students, elementary school students, uh, there is one book that is pretty recent. It's from one of our advisors, um, Mario Ben Castro. He wrote El Niño de Maíz, The Boy of Maize. It's a bilingual book. And it pulls from the Popol Vuh and it pulls from kind of the, the, the Cosmo vision of the Maya to tell the story about uh, a young la land offender um, who is, you know, one with the world around him. And then, you know, another really great book is um, a recent publication called The Popol Vuh, a retelling by Ilan Stavans. He's a scholar of Latin America, uh, Latin American lit literature, and the artwork is phenomenal. And it's by a Salvadoran artist who is based in the UK. So definitely check out these two publications and you'll see the links um, in the chat box, courtesy of Keisha. Thank you. And they're on our website, Social Justice Books, as well. So definitely check them out. But in talking about indigeneity in Central and Latin America, I want to emphasize that it is a complex and ever-evolving identity and concept in Latin America. Central America is also home to a unique Afro-Indigenous community, the Garinagu, which is plural for Garifuna, um, are one group that are descended from both the African and Arawak people of the Caribbean, um, who settled along the coast of Central America. Um, so let's learn a little bit about who they are and where they call home uh, from this video. And I want you to kind of tell me what does what do what does this text teach us about the Garifuna? And also enjoy this painting to the side, Punta One, by a Garifuna artist based in Belize. His name is Isaiah Nicholas. Uh, so here are two texts that you can use in your classrooms, and let's see what we learn. So I definitely recommend, you know, using this video or other videos produced by Garifuna filmmakers and content creators themselves, especially um, an artwork like Punta One by, you know, artists like Isaiah Nicholas in your classrooms to teach about the Garifuna and how complex Black and Indigenous identity can be in Latin America. Oh, and, Central America. Like and, you know, so just to look at a map of the um, Garifuna, the Garifuna, like many other Indigenous groups, are not contained by any specific uh, nation state borders. They are a borderless people in many ways because they span nearly the entire coast of Central America. Um, the video that we watched is about uh, the people of Livingston, Guatemala, and a little piece of Guatemala touch that's next to Belize and Honduras. Um, that's um, on, on the coast touching the ocean. That's where that video is about. But there's Garifuna people in Belize and Honduras especially. Um, and Nicaragua as well. And then there's other Afro-descendant indigenous groups that 
um, coexist with these um, with the Gar with Garinago people, right? So the Garifuna are an Afro-Indigenous group of Central America, and they're also our neighbors in the United States. There is a very significant Garifuna population in California. There is even a Garifuna museum in Los Angeles. So if you ever go to Cali or base there, check it out. Uh, there's Garifuna in or Garinagu in Texas, Louisiana, Florida. There's a lot in New York and New Jersey as well, where they've created a home for themselves. So keep learning about the Garinagu and just you know how powerful their history is. And thinking about you know the power of indigenous peoples, um, I want to introduce you, or I want us to um, learn from these fearless leaders. Uh, who have been on the front lines of indigenous liberation in Honduras. To this day, indigenous peoples of the Isthmus continue to resist against colonial, racist, and industrial violence against their communities and ancestral lands. So we're going to watch um, this video from some key activists of the Lenca and Garifuna communities of Honduras. I want to note, note that Berta Cáceres, who was the first to appear in the video, was an iconic organizer who was assassinated for leading her community in the struggle to protect a river that is sacred to her people. Her daughter, um, Berta Zuniga Cáceres, who appears um, in the video as well, um, she and Miriam Miranda, um, the woman that is to the uh, right in the video, um, she's a Garifuna organizer, and they're speaking about their fight for indigenous liberation. So as we're watching them speak and sh shed light on the, the struggles that they're engaging in in Honduras today, I want you to please, in the chat box, uh, answer the questions, what struggles and issues are indigenous peoples experiencing today, based off the words of uh, these comrades, and what are the visions for change that they present as well? So we're going to watch this video with these fearless leaders, and let's see what you learn. So, you know, please do keep learning about these phenomenal activists uh, from Honduras, um, or modern day Honduras, uh, just powerful leaders that are really on the front lines of indigenous liberation and land defending in Central America. Somebody else that is noteworthy is Rigoberta Menchu, um, whose you know, family has survived, gen generations of her family have survived the genocidal, colonial, racist violence of the Guatemalan government, as well as the Spanish invasion. Um, please do read up on her as well and introduce her to your students and, you know, and, and learn about her vision for change as well. Rigoberta Menchu. But now that we have learned a little more about indigenous struggle and the leaders behind them, I want us to brainstorm together in breakout rooms that um, Keisha will help us with about how we can be in solidarity with indigenous struggle in the isthmus and the world from the US or wherever it is that you are. So in thinking about solidarity projects, what can you dream up? For example, do you want to plan some kind of awareness and educational campaign? Do you want to host leaders and activists and to speak in your classrooms? What do you want to do? What is something creative for a, a solidarity project with for indigenous liberation? So awesome. So let me hear from y'all. What did you dream up in your little groups for indigenous liberation? You can speak up on the microphone or feel free to use a chat box, whatever floats your boat. How to use the popo vu, portions of the popo vu in an English class. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we imagined a bit uh, about asking, I, I, I teach in Appalachia in North, University of North Carolina, Asheville. And uh, as I mentioned earlier, corn is comida typica historically in North Carolina for, for all populations. And then we have quite a, a, a new population of Maya people in Western North Carolina, especially in Morganton, North Carolina. And when students find out that they have corn in common, whether it's our hush puppies historically, or it's tamales, or tortillas, or corn on the cob, elotes, uh, it, it seems to, I mean, food is a great way of coming together. And the popovu corn is so, so central, as you've already mentioned. Amazing, amazing. Definitely, you know, relying on an indigenous and ancestral knowledge to teach us about how we're more alike than different, right? How we're connected in many ways through our sacred food ways. I love that. And Michelle in the chat box says, inviting speakers to Trescott Institute, um, welcoming ceramics information. 
to your ceramics instruction. Uh, Genesis, bringing more than the pilgrim story to my classroom. Thank you. Teaching barely, teachers barely skim native stories here, and usually it's heavily misinformed and from the pilgrim's perspective. Um, these are some great ideas. And so <clears throat> we are going to start transitioning to our closing, my friends. Um, it's been such an honor to learn with you and from you. Um, it, so as you can see, Central America is a rich a region that is dynamic with indigenous histories, cultures, and social movements that continue to define the future of the region and the world. I hope you continue to learn and teach about Central America and its indigenous peoples. Be sure to sign up for and participate in Teach Central America Week that is launching on the 3rd. Uh, you can go fill out a form uh, to commit to uh, participating in Teach Central America Week using our resources or any of yours. And we look forward to hearing about your teaching stories, which you can also access on the website. And we will send you a book from our collection in gratitude. Um, so as we start wrapping up, um, I'm going to do one last thing. We're going to do a poem together, a call and response poem. And then Keisha will give us some really important information for the rest of um, the Institute. Um, <clears throat> so we are going to recite together this poem. I'm going to show it right now called In Lakesh. I hope some of y'all are familiar with it. And if not, no worries. But it is written by this Chicano poet. Uh, um, his name is Luis Valdez, who was really inspired by the Maya concepts of unity and interconnectedness. It is often used in Mexican-American studies, Chicanic studies classrooms. Um, and it's made it was made illegal for some time in some states like Arizona. But of course, when something as beautiful as poetry is made illegal, we should do it even harder, right? So I invite you to please take off your microphone um, so that we can recite this poem together. It will be a call and response. So I will recite the lines in Spanish and you will repeat after me with the lines in English. And that's gonna be our back and forth. I'll do Spanish, uh, you do English. Um, and you know, once we find a rhythm, feel free to join in on the Spanish if you speak Spanish. Um, and that's what we're gonna do. So everybody, please get your microphones off for me. And I will start um, after three. It's going to be a count of three. One, two, three. Tu eres mi otro yo. You are my other me. me. Te hago daño a ti. If, If I, I do harm, harm to you. you. Me hago daño a mí mismo. I do, I do harm, harm to myself. myself. Te amo y respeto. If, If I, I love and respect you. Me amo y respeto yo. I love and respect myself. Beautiful. Thank you, everybody, uh, for being here and learning with us. Um, and so I'm going to pass the mic over to Keisha. And again, thank you for uh, today. It was amazing.